Awesome. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Advanced Interview Prep's first session uh, introduction. Before we get started, we're going to introduce ourselves. The hosts are going to introduce ourselves. We're going to answer the icebreaker questions that you just answered, as well as an additional question that we thought of more relevant to the topic of interviews. And that's what you will or what you have spent your first paycheck on. So I'll go first. My name is Bill. I'm a third year computer science major, and I will be your host today for the first session for advanced interview track. Um, my favorite programming language probably at the moment is Objective-C, just because I, I just like um, iOS dev cycle and, and I just like the Objective-C language and, and closures. It's, it's uh, I don't know, I am, I am a big fan of OCaml. I'm still a big fan, but I feel like I've, I've spent so much time with Objective-C that it's like Stockholm Syndrome, you know, it's like taking me over. <laughs> uh, my favorite flavor is Linux is, I actually haven't used Linux too often. So I guess only one that I've used somewhat is Arch, so probably Arch Linux. Would be my pick. Um, here am I, and I'm a third year. And my favorite type of chocolate at the moment, I have to say it's milk chocolate. I'm sorry, <laughs> but I'm willing to try uh, different percentages and give different types of chocolate a shot. <laughs> sorry, Kate. And um, for the final question, what I have spent my first paycheck on is I actually think I spent on my current phone, which is a OnePlus 7, um, OnePlus 7 Pro, I think. And so, yeah, that's definitely something that was like proud to be able to like buy myself with my own like paycheck and everything. And feel free to answer what you would or you what you will spend using your first paycheck in that as well. Um, and I'll pass it on to Anna. Hi, everyone. My name is Anna, and I helped lead the workshop last quarter. For helping out Bill, the main guy. So let's just go through all the five questions. So, favorite program language? I would say Python. Um, even though I am in ICPC, I just think I can do stuff a lot faster in Python, just because I code Python in my previous internship as well, and I do it day to day. My favorite flavor of Linux, I actually thought of this question and I was hoping is I'll pick chocolate or vanilla just so they can out themselves as they use Linux or just doing it for a joke. Because the only, I think, ice cream flavor on here that's a, a Linux flavor is mint. So uh, unfortunately, I am just an Ubuntu user. I am very, uh, what's it called? Normal, I guess that's the right word. Okay. What year am I? I am a junior. And my favorite type of chocolate, I would say dark chocolate now, but I was intrigued by this chocolate that came out last year called Ruby chocolate, which is not real chocolate, basically. Uh, but it, it tastes very good. So there's that. And lastly, what I would buy with my first paycheck, uh, I, I guess I what I bought for my first paycheck. I bought these headphones and they're nice. And I regret kind of spending full price on them because they're not, they're like discounted for like a hundred dollars now, but you know, I digress. I'll pass it off to Katie. Hi guys, I'm Katie. Um, yeah, pretty hyping in the chat. I am a sophomore. Right now I'm a sophomore computer science major. It's double math. And um, my favorite language is probably C++. Um, I really like lower level languages instead of Python. I spent so much time debugging yesterday. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, uh, Linux, I like Bantu, pretty basic. Chocolate is pretty obvious. I like dark chocolate. And dark, I mean like 90%, 100%. Don't talk to me if you're like 70%. That's not dark. Um, okay, what else? Oh, paycheck. Um, I have a cat, so I spent my first 
this paycheck on my cat buying stuff for her uh snacks and stuff she's uh obviously a little bit chubby right now so can't do that anymore so yeah okay i'll pass it to sarthik okay hi everyone i'm sarthik and i'm a second year cs major uh, my favorite programming language is probably C++ because of just familiarity. And uh, I don't think I have a good answer for Linux because I'm not really a Linux user. I mean, I guess I've used Debian because of CS111, but that's the extent of my exposure. Um, my favorite type of chocolate is 50%, which is like adequately dark and milk. And um, I'd probably spend my first paycheck on hype-based clothing. Great, great. Looks like that's everyone. Uh, yeah, and uh, feel free to like, you know, share answers to questions in the chat or uh, justify, try to justify your answers in the chat. Um, otherwise, we can get started. So I'm going to start by quickly going over um, some of the background and the context for, you know, like what are technical interviews uh, and like sort of what the process is for interviewing with uh, tech companies uh, for uh, technical roles. And I'm doing this just to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Um, in case you haven't come to one of our earlier sessions and uh, you've like taken CS32 or similar CS classes, but you haven't uh, come to one of our sessions. If you have, probably have seen most of these before, but I'm going to try to go through really quickly so we can get on to advanced practice problems. What's a technical interview? Um, as you, most of you should know, they're used by tech companies during recruitment to assess a SWEs or a data scientist or a QA's skills, and they can take many forms from online assessments, which are much more common uh, these days in, in, during the pandemic, technical phone screens, as well as virtual on-sites. Um, of course, in person, it's not being possible at the moment. So what's asked for technical review? Usually there are short coding questions where you write a program in a language of your choice that's uh, supposed to solve a problem, uh, provide some output given an input, as well as follow-up questions on the problem itself, your solution, and specifically the time and complexity. So stuff that you should have picked up during CS32 and then and more upon in CS180 uh, and how to potentially improve your program in the future. And so these questions are supposed to test your knowledge of data structures and algorithms. And that's sort of the key aspect I want you to take away is that ultimately the type of interview um, wants to test your knowledge of data structures and algorithms, not necessarily your syntax or how well you can program in your time period. I'll go over the process quickly. So usually recruitment process, if you've never gone through it before, usually um, you starting at one of these like purple. The idea is you can either apply online, through career fairs, through referrals, um, through cold emailing sometimes. And eventually all of these will eventually get you a recruiter contact, after which you will be either given a online assessment or a phone screen or an on-site interview. Um, in some combination of these, usually starting with the online assessment or a phone screen. then you will be given the decision whether or not you got the offer or not. Um, and so I also posted a link to the slides in the chat. If you take a look at these and refer to this in the future. Now, as an aside, we're gonna be focusing on more advanced technical questions, but I'm gonna quickly demonstrate kind of, or give tips on how to answer more behavioral questions. So these might be asked um, in the remaining five minutes of a 45 minute or 50 minute interview, or might have its own interview. Um, and the idea is this is to make sure that you are a good culture fit and that you understand um, how to like, collaborate and work as a team. So what um, I believe this chart is actually taken out of a pretty popular book called Cracking the Coding Interview. 
which we highly recommend, is a good framework to be prepared to have a prophylactic response to behavioral questions. Um, so this way you can prepare to have any, like prepare for any one of these common behavioral questions such as, you know, tell us a project that you found a, that you found a challenge and, and what was that challenge? Tell us one of your mistakes and failures and how you overcame it. Tell us an example of your leadership. Tell us when you came into conflict with a team member and how you resolved it. Um, and the idea is that you come up with three different projects you've done before. This could definitely vary based on your experience. If you haven't done three, maybe then only one project that you want to talk about, as well as come up with situations as well as how you overcame those challenges during those same situations. Um, and just like pre think of answers to those problems in this kind of chart. And for example, if you do this well, um, before the fall interviewing cycle starts, you're going to be totally prepared for any behavioral questions that you ever encounter. It's super useful. And now we're diving into how to prepare for technical interviews. So what uh, we think is the most important factor for preparing for technical interviews is that you always practice and practice, practice, practice is the most important part, especially if you make your practice more like the real thing, because half of technical interviewing is being able to communicate your solution and your knowledge of data structures and algorithms to the interviewer, um, who's an engineer. And so if you only practice problems online or just arbitrary problems and you try to code with solutions, to them, that's only half of, of what you're practicing, right? Um, you need to be able to communicate your solution and your thought process and your knowledge of these algorithmic rule structures to the interviewer. Because even if you have the best solution and the best knowledge of, um, of data structures and algorithms, if you're unable to communicate them to your interviewer and in the future to your teammates uh, and the people that you're going to be working with, then you're not going to be super useful to them, uh, to that company. And so I'm going to take a quick meme break. This is a, <laughs> sometimes I've heard at least, I've never encountered this, but uh, fairly common in terms of interviewing, uh, as well as like job searching when you have to interview for a fast paced and dynamic software engineering job, ends up being just firefights <laughs> all the time. Okay, cool. What is the focus of advanced interview prep? So the core idea of advanced interview prep is to teach advanced algorithms and data structures tested in later interview rounds, especially stuff like virtual onsites. We're going to practice more complex interview problems, and we're going to focus on improving your communication skills by having you explain your thought process to others while problem solving. Um, so one companion that we feel like is super important in terms of uh, practicing uh, learning advanced data structures and practicing complex interview problems are um, these online resources, Leak Code, Hacker Rank, which are basically online um, places to that have like big question banks of common interview problems and common um, technical interview problems that you can practice via their online judge. And so um, like for example, I personally use LeetCode, and I'm going to talk about a little bit about my personal journey through technical interviewing, um, just to give some context on what my personal experience is. So I usually practice on LeetCode, and as you can see here, I definitely didn't start out um, very experienced in terms of LeetCode. Uh, when I was a freshman, I had only done maybe 30 practice problems. Um, this is kind of a combination of problems I've done solo online, as well as mock interviews that I've done with, um, for example, friends. And so I, um, that summer I was interning at InTouch Health. And then when I was a sophomore, I got up to around like 75 problems. And, um, and like, as you can see, as I sort of leak code and my the number of practice increased, my interviewing skills um, and my ability to get opportunities and internships that I got, for example, my sophomore year, I was interning at Facebook and my uh, junior winter, I was interning at Instagram and this upcoming summer, I'll be at TikTok. 
Um, I can also see a question in the chat by Yun. So is your is it only your knowledge of data structures and algorithms? I've heard of interview questions where they ask you what your approach be to design a large project or a large program. Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, in terms of interviews where they ask design questions, yes, definitely those, there will be interviews. So usually there are three types of interviews. There are uh, behavioral interviews, there are technical interviews, and there are system design interviews. And um, especially if you're going to be interviewing for a full-time job, uh, for a new grad job, there's going to be a lot of times where they uh, try to ask how to how you would approach designing a system. For example, they might ask you like um, try to like design Twitter or like how would Twitter work, um, or, like design Pinterest. And so they would ask you to come up with all the kind of technical technical components for large system those and how and you have to explain how you have to uh, handle scale um, those kind of questions are definitely very common they're not going to be our focus we're going to be focusing on technical interviews so uh, interviews where you're trying to answer coding problems and specific you know trying to write a, a specific piece of code to answer a problem but those are definitely uh, very common and i think there are a lot of common online resources to deal with those likely code and hacker rank where um, you can there's like a question bank of common questions as well as approaches that people have thought of that um, have satisfied like interviewees and interviewers so as you can see here with my personal experience with the code i think i took this screenshot in um in around this fall i believe so around um six months ago and as you can at this point i had done 130 problems um, and as you can see here above, there's a split of around like 40 easy, 60 mediums and 15 hards. And so, of course, you don't have to start with mediums and hards right away. Um, uh, you can definitely like start with easier problems and work your way up. But of course, this is advanced interview track and we will be diving straight into uh, harder problems because we make the assumption that you've taken like CS32 and that you familiarize with a lot of basic data structure other than knowledge. And again, I get this question very commonly. Um, you know, people ask me, hey, Bill, what like language should I choose to code in? And I've talked with a lot of people who have been really successful in terms of interviewing and, and internships. I think the common denominator is that you should code in the language that you're most comfortable in. And most, most companies will be able to accommodate for languages. Um, this workshop specifically will be taught in C++, although we'll try to provide answers in uh, like, like written on solutions in both C++ and Python, uh, if possible. And um, in general, though, use pick the pick language you're most comfortable with. And if you'd like to get more comfortable in a language, then um, you know that would this would also be a great opportunity to try to answer the questions that we're going to be practicing using that new language that you know you want to learn. Oh. Okay, yeah, so this is a great, another great meme uh, from TikTok that I did see. I think it was really funny when I saw it in terms of how the technical interviewing um, world looks at compared to doing in other fields. So yeah, enjoy this short video before we head on to break. Oh yes, I do need to share sound, I believe. Share sound. Okay, chat, let, let me know if I can, uh, if you can hear this. Good, so what do you do in your free time? Uh, in my free time, I'm not sure how that's relevant. Like I spend time with my family, I go on runs. Oh, so you don't like perform surgery in your free time or do like free medical consults on the subway? Uh, no, I love being a doctor, but it's my job. That's a bummer, because we are really looking for someone who also does their job outside of work. But like, not for money. <laughs> no, 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 no. If you were really passionate about being a doctor, you wouldn't want money. But, oh, don't worry, we'll still give you a chance. Why don't you just write down everything you remember from medical school on this web? Good, so what do you do in your- <laughs> Yeah, definitely interesting uh, to see how 
complex that uh, the, the software engineering interviewing process has gotten. <laughs> okay, great. So before we move on to warm problems, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back at 6.35. Warm up problem. Okay, well, back, welcome back from the break. We're going to start off with a warm up problem that I think many of you have already seen before because I believe this is featured in CS32 as one of your homeworks um, in at least one of the two years. But the reason why I chose this problem is because I want to be able to go over the four steps of what you should do during a technical interview as compared to in CS32 when you were solving the problem for class is what is the difference between just solving something for class and solving something for a technical interview where you have to pay attention to uh, what you're doing in order to communicate to the interviewer about what you know about the data structures that them to you. So here's our first homework problem. Given an n times n binary grid, which represents a map of land, ones, and zeros, return the number of islands, which are formed by connecting adjacent lands horizontally or vertically, but not diagonally. So in this example, as you can see, there are three islands. There is one two by two island in the top left, one one by one island in the center, and there's one one by two island in the bottom right. And so in this case, you would output a three. Uh, if, for example, this zero here was a one, then you would only have two islands, right? So I'm gonna assume that most of you have seen this problem in some form before and kind of know what the solution is kind of. Um, so I guess if, you've, if you have any ideas, put them in the chat, but I'm gonna try to approach this problem in a way that I would during a technical interview and sort of guide you through it. This is like the warm problem. We're gonna have a proper practice problem that Anna's gonna go over um, after this one where you guys are gonna get a chance to kind of answer it yourselves. But this is one that I just wanna walk through to make sure everyone knows what to do. Um, so I guess the first thing that I want everyone to know is that the first thing you should do for any problem is read the problem yourself and try to explain the problem in your own words to the interviewer, right? This is to make sure, this is kind of full, right? One is to make sure that you are, you're, you actually understand the problem as it's given to you. So you know exactly what the question is asking and what it's giving you, as well as being able to communicate to your interviewer that you are capable of being some kind of like spec, some requirements, and then being able to internalize that, understand that, and be able to communicate that to other people. And so the first thing I would do is I would say, okay, so the idea is you're giving me a like a binary grid with ones and zeros, and you want to find islands um, that are connected horizontally or vertically. Islands of one, so that goes on horizontally, vertically. Like, is that correct? And the interviewer would say, like, yes, or like, maybe no. You've understood this wrong way, maybe, and you would move on from there. Um, the second step I would take is ask clarifying questions. So again, this is twofold. One is if you're uncertain about something with the input or output, you always want to clarify this. You don't want to be clarifying things when you're writing out the solution, where you try to debug it or test it or um, run some test cases. You want to make sure you understand the requirements and the constraints of your input and output before you move on to a problem uh, to solve the problem. And so, for example, something I ask here is, okay, is the input binary grid is it um, is m times m times n is it going to be always like a rectangle? Like, is it going to be m times n always? Can there be um, I don't know, like a six value here. Uh, another question I might ask is, um, is it possible for there to be, like is M, uh, what N guaranteed to be greater than uh, one or greater? Can, can either value be zero? And if so, um, what should I output? Like should I output zero or should I say, hey, that's like invalid, should I output like negative one? Um, and also another question I might ask is, I assume that um, everything outside is everything like outside the grid that you're given is like represented by water or like a zero in the sense that um, if you have every 
element you're in is a one, it's that one whole island um, because it's going to be a surround of zeros all around. And so um, in the chat, if you'd like to come up with some problems that you think would be useful to ask this question, go ahead. But that's what I would do as well. So again, this is two, as I explained before, one is to make sure you actually understand it, um, like the constraints for this problem, and two, to communicate in the interview that you are capable of asking questions. Because asking questions is one of the, the most important parts of being a software engineer is being able to clarify and dispel ambiguity about a spec you're given or about a project you're working on. And this is a surprisingly, um, I guess, like difficult thing to do. Sometimes you say like you make assumptions and you, and you work with those assumptions, but when your reality is that you need to be able to ask questions about things you're uncertain about. So I think this is super important to communicate in the interviewer as well. Um, and then here, after you've gone through those first two steps, the third thing I would do is I would start brainstorming and um, and thinking of uh, possible test cases. So before even thinking of like a solution, I would do like a dry run of, I would try to make like a test case and um, try to come up with the input and the output, and then verify that my understanding of the question is correct by uh, using that test case that I've created. So I might like create some kind of island combination on some input, and I'll come up with an output that I think is correct by just intuition, by my understanding of the problem. And then I would verify that with the interviewer. And again, that is just to um, further reinforce that you understand the problem. And I'll like keep, like notice that I haven't even started thinking about the solution to the problem yet. And I've already done like three things. I've already gone through three steps. And I think this is super important is that you, like, you wanna be able to make sure you understand the problem and that you, you're able of communicating with the interviewer and talking about the problem before you even start thinking about the solution. And so the fourth step uh, finally is I would think about brainstorming solutions, right? So I'm not touching any code yet. I'm writing any code, not touching ID yet. I'm just brainstorming about what I believe would be a possible solution for this. Uh, and the key point about this is I'm gonna brainstorm about a solution and I'm gonna talk about what I think it, the time and this complexity is gonna be for the solution. And then I'm going to talk with the interviewer and we're gonna go back and forth to see if uh, we both agree that this is a good solution or not, like if this is an efficient solution, as well as if it's going to be viable to implement. And only after the interviewer says, um, yeah, let's go ahead, implement this idea, would I start actually committing any ideas to code? And so I think that's like one other thing that's important to keep in mind is like, even if you can think of a great idea is that you don't want to waste time coming up with an idea that might not be what the interviewer wants and then getting to implementing that and then finding out later that, oh, like that's not actually the most, that's not the, actually the solution we're looking for at the very end of the interview, right? And so even if like the interviewer doesn't say anything before you start writing code, and you have an idea, communicate the idea to an interviewer and literally you can ask like, do you think I should implement this idea in code? And they will be able to say like, yes, I think it's a good idea or no, maybe is there any, anything we can improve about the algorithm? Is there any improvements we can make to the timer space complexity? And like what other data structures or algorithm we could use? And, um, and then you could like go back to the drawing board. So for this question specifically, um, like what do you guys think I guess I'll ask the chat first for like, I'll give you guys 30 seconds. It's like, what do you guys think would be a good solution for this problem? Okay, uh, I guess I will take that as, oh, here we go. Great, great. Okay, Aristotle has great answer. 
if has through grid modify array locations once visited. So yeah, so that is 100% correct. Um, the core concept of this is to be able to treat the binary grid as a graph where edges are between nodes where uh, you're connecting things horizontally or vertically, right? So for example, there would be an edge between the two ones here and then the one and the zero and the zero and zero. Um, and you could uh, run a death first search on all of the ones that you find. And start in the top left corner, you can like death first search by only going in two directions, um, right and down. And then you can modify the array locations to be zero once you visited them. And so after you've completed a, an entire DFS, like you've run non uh, zero grid elements to visit, then you can count that as visited one entire island. And so that's perfectly correct. And you would, you would talk about this and you would say, okay, what, um, what's the time complexity? And so the time complexity is that I, actually, I'll ask you, Aristotle, do you know the time complexity for that algorithm in terms of M and N? Um, yeah, so I guess I'll go over it really quickly because I think it's it's pretty evident. Um, if you DFS through your locations, oh great, I saw it came up with the solution. It's gonna be O times N times N. That is, um, that, that's correct. The idea is, is that you will only visit each node in your uh, graph of uh, your binary grid at maximum twice, right? Um, uh, or in theory, maximum once, uh, I guess, is that you're gonna DFS through it, um, and then you're going to, uh, sorry, it's going to be maximum twice, but it's gonna be O of two times N times N, which is gonna to reduce to O of N times N. The reason why you're gonna visit everything maximum twice is because you're going to have to check if, a, um, if an element is one or zero, and if it's one, you're going to DFS through all of the ones, and then you're going to might have to go back to uh, a one that you've replaced now with a zero that you've modified the locations to be zero to check if you need to DFS through that again. Um, and so you're going to be maximum be visiting everything twice, um, but most likely you're going to be visiting everything once, and it's just going to be O of M times N. Yep. And so now that you've uh, localized the your idea of the solution as well as the time, uh, complexity, then you can uh, move on to ask K interviewer, is this a good idea to implement? And the interviewer is going to say, um, yeah, that's that's great. I'll go ahead and implement that. And then only now can you uh, start actually implementing it in code, right? And this means that you, you've demonstrated that you understand the problem, that you are able to communicate and ask questions and clear up uncertainty and ambiguity about the problem that you um, know about data structures and algorithms and have applied it to that problem and that you've come up with a solution that is good to the interviewer. And now you can start coding, right? And so like coding the actual question up is like maybe only 40% or so of the problem, right? The rest of it is like actually thinking of it. So now I'm going to switch to the um, a replet so that we can, oh, okay, cool. Uh, here, okay, can you guys see the screen still? Um, it's like a, like a replet screen. Let me know, I'm gonna open the chat. Okay, looks like you can, okay, great. And so now um, you come up with the solution and now you, you're, you're able to code the solution up and get started. So here we can get started. Um, we know that we want to return a integer, so we can take a function, number islands, 
Um, one thing that you might want to ask when you're coding is, um, am I given sort of like a function statement that we need to work with? Uh, am I given a specific input parameters of what the structure of the uh, input will look like? Usually they'll say like, it could be anything you want. Um, and so here I will go, since this is a C++, I'm going to go with um, a vector vector bins. And this will be our grid. And then we can uh, initialize the grid size. Um, okay, here, actually, Sartak is a good question. So we take pick BFS instead of DFS here. So the reason why, so I guess this is actually a really important question because um, although in theory, I think DFS and DFS would have the same time complexity, um, DFS does have a efficiency improvement over BFS, right? Um, and that's because I, I believe if you use BFS for a problem like this, um, you're going to be checking on average, kind of more, um, more like grid elements that you wouldn't using DFS. I think also it depends on the shape of the islands ultimately. Um, if the islands are going to be mainly like large swaths of land, um, like with minimal kind of circumference or like surface area. Um, compared to something that is like more complex. And so again, this could be a question that you could bring up to your interview and say, hey, like, should I go with DFS or DFS? Because and you can provide the pros and cons of each and whether it applies to the situation. I think in practice, most of the times, especially if um, you know, the idea of coming up with these solutions and for, for specific island configurations, usually they are less kind of like round and less um, simple in terms of the configurations. And so DF is more useful here, but definitely like that's something that you should clarify with your interviewer um, and with the person who's in charge of the problem. Okay, great. And so here, we first, um, we can make sure that we are given a, a grid that actually has a, um, as dimensions. And again, this is one of the problems that I asked earlier in terms of when we were asking about clarifying questions, like, can I get a zero dimension? Can M or N be zero? And the interviewer says yes here. So um, we have to check for this. We know that either of these are zero now, that we can immediately return zero because um, there are no islands. Uh, let's say the interviewer said like, hey, you don't have to return negative one or anything, just return zero. And so here, um, one cool tip that I have when dealing with um, doing DFS or BFS through grids is I like to have like a dimension matrix. So I know you do this also with like pairs, um, but I just like to use like two arrays, like an X dimension matrix and a Y dimension array. And this can be useful later as we do DFS. And then we can um, have a count of islands that we can return at the very end. Okay, great. And so now we can uh, try to do DFS through the grid. And so the simplest way we can do this is just loop through every element um, here. And then here we can check if um, the grid value is going to be a one or a zero. And so we can say, uh, let's see, grid ij equals one. 
Uh, now that we know that there's a one, there's going to be at least one island here. So we can actually immediately increment count. And then here we can uh, perform DFS. And so what we want to do is DFS is uh, perform using a stack. So we can initialize a stack that holds a pair of coordinates. Oops. Uh, we we'll want also make sure that we are including a stack. Okay, great. And then we can uh, push the bit that we're currently on into the stack. So this would be i and j. And then we can perform our while loop to actually do DFS. Uh, so while stack isn't empty, we can this and take the chords off the, the stack. And we're going to have our x be first value and uh, whoops, yes, second value. And then we can pop our value at the top of the stack off the stack. Okay. Uh, so here, now that we visit this element, we can modify the array uh, to demonstrate that we visited. This is kind of a different way of doing a visited set to keep track of places you already visited. This makes it much easier because um, you can just modify the array directly and not keep track of another data structure. So we can set grid x, y directly to be zero. And then uh, here, what we can do is we can iterate through the, um, the four different directions that I mentioned. So actually here, we only need to check two directions, I believe, um, to the right and down. So actually, we, we can uh, delete two directions from here. Uh, here, right and down, I believe, so that would be plus. There we go. And we can just iterate through the directions. Um, and we can have something like this with our new coordinates that we want to check. And here. And then we want to make sure that these are within the parameters of their input. as well as the fact that it is a one that we're visiting. If this, if this is the case, then we can push the new coordinate into our stack. Okay, great. And this, so this should be a working solution for us. Um, and so first, we want to make sure that this can compile. I'm just going to run it first. Uh, great, so I get compiled. And now, um, what is actually important to do is uh, come up with your, like, write your test cases. So let's try and use the test case that we did in our, um, in our full input. So I believe we'll get something like this. Okay, and we want to create our grid.
Let me do this again. This. Okay, great. So now we have our input and we know our output should be three. Uh, so let's see if we get three as our output. So if we run and it gives us three. And so this is, uh, looks like it works. And one thing that we recommend is after that you've come up, run some like sanity checks on example inputs that you've been given, you can come up with uh, more complex examples if you have the time. But otherwise that kind of uh, the interview process is that now that you've come up with the working solution and that you've debugged it and that you've verified that it works with uh, examples, you can now, you know, those are kind of the six steps that you've taken and you've you know, gone through your first proper interview. Um, and so we're going to, I think we're going to have this, of course, we're going to have the recording of this first uh, warm-up problem as well as a more detailed solution write-up for every problem that we do uh, on GitHub. And we're going to post that to Facebook and probably get our YouTube as well. And yeah, uh, I think that wraps it up for now. For this example problem, we're going to go on to tackle a harder problem uh, that hopefully you guys haven't seen before, but it's definitely uh, more challenging than this one. And so first, I want to pull you guys about what you thought about this problem and what you thought about the explanation. And then we're going to take a short break after Anna's going to take over and we're going to tackle the second problem I think, with uh, the breakout rooms. I'm not 100% sure though. Um, yeah, we're going to go on a five minute break and we're going to come back with our second problem. You guys will be in breakout rooms to confirm. Bill. Okay, awesome. great. Well, back from the break, everyone. I'm going to uh, add a um, clarification. I did, I believe, have the wrong solution to that previous problem. Um, I'm going to back out and head back. So, yes, I do believe you would need to check all four directions in terms of my direction, not just two, because let's say you have an island like this. Um, I believe you wouldn't be able to, like, this would count as actually four instead of three. So if I run here, it will give me a four, right, exactly. So I would need to check all four directions. Um, I believe I brought that up in the chat. So thank you. Right here, yeah. four directions. I believe I had this in my notes as well. I kind of just ignored it because I, um, I thought it would, would work. It definitely does not. And if I run here, they give me three. Um, oh, okay, this is weird. It does need five. Wait. Okay, we will, uh, I'll come back to this later, but you're definitely correct that we need to check all four directions. Um, we'll have like a proper solution in our, um, Oh, yes, yes, here we go. That's it. Check out four. And yeah, there go. there's the three. And so, again, we'll have more detailed solution walkthroughs um, through uh, post on GitHub afterwards. And these kind of mistakes, I think your interviewer will like give you a hint on or like give you tips on um, if you miss something like this. So, definitely get. Be, be ready to vocalize and communicate with your interviewer on every step of the way so that um, it's possible to, for some, you, both you and the interviewer to debug these problems together. Um, but otherwise, we're going to move on to the next problem. Uh, here we go. Um, big overview again, I think most of you guys are really familiar with this considering big NTS32, so I won't go through it too much. Um, again, this is how to approach technical interviews. These are six steps that I believe um, Google actually recommends to its interviewees when you're interviewing with Google. Like they will give you an article that has like these six steps. So definitely super important to keep in mind. Definitely recommend like having this in a sticky note somewhere when you're interviewing and just like go through all, these, all six of these steps. And I'm going to hand it over to Anna for the practice problem. 
All right, everyone. So we're going to go over one practice question. This will be the breakout room question. So hopefully you guys are ready to mingle with each other. Um, at least we hope you do. Um, so basically use what Bill like had on the previous slide. Basically don't think of it as like, oh, I'm just solving this. Like if I were a homework question, like CS32, this is my homework coming up. Be sure to try to talk to your uh, breakout room. I don't know if that's the right word. Uh, and kind of explain your thought process just as if you were in a technical interview. I think that's the point of this workshop is to basically hone your talking skills, not talking skills, communication skills, as well as your coding skills. So let me just go over this problem. So in an array, a given an array of K linked lists, each linked list is sorted in descending order. So then we're going to merge all the lists in one and return it. So this is the structure of the list nodes. So the array of k lists would be just like a link list node in each separate um i guess array in the c so as you can see our input is 5414362 and we would get something in um descending order so we're going to open you guys up okay so welcome back everybody we're going to go over our practice this question, which is on the screen right now. So hopefully you guys had some good discussions. Uh, do you guys mind typing in the chat if you got, if you had any like edge cases you wanted to be sure to go through, as well as like, clarifications you would ask an interviewer in this specific question. So type in the chat. If not, I will just talk instead. Okay, five seconds. Our empty lists up. Uh, Empty list valid. So great question. So what if you get an empty list as one of your like maybe you have multiple lists and then one of them is empty? In that case, then just abandon it and then sort on the um, remaining lists. Or if all the lists that you get are empty lists, then you would just return null in that case. So they're all good question to ask your interviewer. And then uh, let's see. Yeah. Uh, go on. So what was and what was something that you thought you like? I guess what data structure did you guys think you would use in order to do this question? Because like I think we all know how to merge two lists. We were given like um, it would be like divide and conquer, or we would like compare and like using two pointers. But this is k number of lists, so we don't actually know how many we're going to be getting. Did you guys think of a what's it called? Uh, a full proof method. Uh, if not, I'll tell you what I did <laughs> instead. Um, so, if, Bill, do you mind going to the record? Priority queue. Yes. Very nice. So, there's a priority queue in this case because that just gives us the flexibility of, you know, only. Like the basically the 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 program will tell give us like what what's happening. Okay. Um, the program will tell us which ones of the most priority depending on what we set our comparator to, and therefore we don't have to compare. Like when we extract each node from the priority queue, um, it's only going to be over one. It would be fast. So we always like to go fast, just like Sonnet. So let's get into this. So I, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to copy our struct for our list node. So this is the, the, the same one that I paste that was on the slides. And this is just like a good basic list node that I think you would see a lot of the times on a like technical interview if you were to come across this list. OK, so we have our struct list node. And I have a, so Unfortunately, we did not view the name of the function that you'd be. Uh, and then I did say that you guys are doing an array of uh, lists, but um, when I did this on uh, code, they, code, they used a vector, and I just like vectors better. So in this case, we're going to do a vector. Of course, we're going to be passing in a vector in this node, and we're going to be passing in a location. If that makes sense. Very 
nice. Okay, so just like what Bonnie said, we're going to be having a prior EQ. So did I spell prior EQ? No, this is not what I meant. Okay. And then what are we going to have for each of the, uh, what, what, what two of the, have a list node pointer. And then we're also going to be appending the rest of the list node uh, of that list into our part of the project. And if you guys aren't familiar with a, a priority queue, I do strongly recommend looking, with, uh, looking up what it is and also the fact that you can set a comparator. So this is going to be school for now because we're going to be defining our priority queue. So we'll just call it PQ for priority queue. Okay, sounds good. And so how should we define our comparator? Uh, does anybody want to? I don't know, like, give me a tip, or I can just code it up myself. So, in this case, what is the highest priority for us? Like, what do we want to extract first? Can anybody tell me? Okay. Okay. So, so this is. A, we're merging and descending, right? So what we want the largest value coming out first, right? In this case, we're going to be calling our bool operator and then this is a this node. It's going to take in A and B. There is an order to this. So yeah, okay, hopefully that makes sense. So we're going to be returning the comparison between the value of the as long as it is less than. So this makes sense. Like we want the priority P, whatever is greater to come out first. I assume there's no questions. So um, what is the here? Oops. So once again, I have these weird squiggles, but I hope they are good. So don't forget to always have a colon after your uh, any I guess no, that's just the go to. So now that we have our comparator function, a uh, comparator function, yeah, a comparator done. Does anyone have any questions about um, why I wrote a comparator? In first? If not, I'll just answer myself again. Okay, so we wrote a comparator because there is no like default comparator for a list node. You can't compare a list node because it's not a um, like a default variable type, right? So in this case, we just made our own so that uh, it's going to be easy to let the priority know what they're comparing. So, yeah. so let's go on. And so what are we going to do first? We're going to be wanting to have each of the head nodes first, right, into our priority queue. That's what we're starting out with. So in this case, we're going to just use auto because that's going to be your best friend when you uh, do anything C++, I guess. Oh. Yeah, that's the best Okay, so I just quickly change my for loop, and then all just makes everything easy. So I'm going to be iterating through all of the list heads within the list. So it's very nice, and I don't have to worry about it. So just like what Bonnie said, what if there's an empty list? So if there's an empty list, be it a null, right? So we have to check if the head off is valid, and if it is valid, oh, oops, why did I just like this? It is valid that we're going to push it to our priority queue. And when we push the priority, the priority queue would, um, I mean, this is the first element, but if it were the second element coming in, then it would compare and see which one should be on the top of the priority queue. Does that make sense? Yes. And can someone tell me well, what is the cost of inserting for a priority queue, knowing that? Um, 
Hopefully, you guys already know what a proxy is. So. Yes, log in. Very nice. Okay, so hopefully, that gives you kind of a rough idea of what the time complexity is. Um, if you know it, good for you, but I haven't finished, so maybe do your name. So the next we're going to do is we're going to check for the priority to empty. So we would just break out, usually leave the function. Um, just like what Bonnie did, like, oh, what if you just get like empty? This is okay, don't waste your time. Just leave, which is good basically out uh, this space to just, like code in internal. Very nice. Okay, now comes um I guess like the actual uh not algorithm, but I would say the actual algorithm. So what we always do if we were uh, given a list node is we always stress to have a dummy node getting just so that when you do end up traversing through your list and end and it, you maybe like can't find your original um like string node a dummy node is always nice to have point to your this is the next like your dummy node would point to the first element just so you never lose your place i I always, I always recommend using the dummy. So I'm just going to do, and this would just be zero or whatever you want, because we're actually not going to use it, so it doesn't matter what we do. But I'll use um, initialize it too. The next step, we're going to have a here to our dummy node for now, but it's basically just going to be, we're going to be versus the um, link list. Call this current, so I just close my. And I'm going to make it point to dummy for now. And then after that, so we're just going to, you know, put basically a regular priority queue. So we're going to just go, as long as it's not empty, we're going to reverse it through, right? Not empty. Uh, so what is the, what the first thing we have to do? Can we come? What do we want to see? No, okay, it's okay. I can answer my own questions. <laughs> so we're gonna pop it. Oh, thank you, Bonnie. Yes, we're, you're right. We're just gonna pop it off. But before we pop it, we gotta pop it first. All right, popping actually returns nothing. So I'd be sad if we popped it before we actually got what the value is. So pick it out top just to see what it is. And then we're going to pop it off. Don't need it anymore. Goodbye. And so to see if next up top so this is like multiple link lists right so the current head of the top so top basically acts like the head so as long as there's more stuff after top which is the remaining list of its list you need to put it back into the priority queue and then the queue like tells us what the um order is like the priority is and we don't have to worry about, oh, what if there's a value F in that's like greater, right? Because um, we at, in the beginning specified that they're in non descending order. So that means a non descending, non ascending, non ascending. I think it's not ascending um, <laughs> order. So we don't have to worry about that. So in this case, we're going to see if there is a um, element after the current top. If there is, we're going to push it. Yeah. As you know, you guys said before, pushing uh, pushing a node would just take log log n. Okay. Uh, is this an extra parentheses? Or is it, am I just hallucinating? Okay, not. So after that, what we're going to do is we're going to set the next element to the top. So this is our current list, right? So current list is kind of sad. There's only one element. Uh, actually, there's zero elements. Dummy doesn't count as. Sorry. Uh, one of our elements. So we're going to set the next of our print equal to the top, which is the most priority. And in this case, in this case, it means that it is the greatest value for those nodes. So in that case, we're going to set our next to the top. And then we're going to move our current node to the top just so that when we iterate the next iteration for the while loop, then we'll be setting the next point. Next, or else we'd just be with one node, and then we would just not never move, and that's no bueno. Okay, so afterwards, same. 
we have a dummy note. So, oh no, what if I don't know? You know, like current, current's all the way at the end now. No way to come back, but it's okay. We have a dummy, so we can just return dummy. Make sense? Are we good? Uh, does anybody have any questions? It's always good to ask. Question. Okay. So what's solving a problem you can't test it? So I've already written a um, basically like a test case as well as a print function. So this would just be good for debugging, right? Like if I were to be in an interview and then I actually had to um, my code. having a debugging like print statement would be really helpful for a question like this just because uh, you get to see which elements are actually um i guess like the order that your priority queue is getting up. So, okay so in our space i already gone ahead and done this but i'll just check it out so we have to have a vector of list nodes right so list nodes I think it's just this node. I don't know why it's just this node. Okay, and now we're going to just call this test because I am not creative. Okay, we're going to test zero. New node. So, uh, I mean, you can do any number you want, but don't. I guess, like, one thing you can ask is, like, oh, what if you have like an invalid um, list mode? And then I, as an interviewer, will just tell you you won't get that. So let's worry about it. <laughs> it's always good to ask. So in that case, we're going to use zero next. And we're going to set it to a new node again. Okay. Uh, I won't waste your time because we're actually already over time. But just gonna just gonna paste what I have so that you can see. Apparently, I named something different. Uh, I really like to add random S's, so apparently uh, now it's good. So as you can see here, basically I just created a, instead of K equals basically in this case. Make sense? So we're going to test this and hopefully that's the right answer. Oh, yes, this is 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So obviously it's really nice to have a visual input of what I is actually printed out. Um, and so if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask right now. And uh, can somebody give me the, uh, what's it called? The time complexity, because that's the most important. What's the time complexity for this algorithm that I just did? We can walk it through together. So we have a for loop, right? But the for loop is just K heads and uh, just like uh, at most we have like in separate, um, what's it called? N separate then it's all n, right? Because we're just, but then we push it. So all n, and we do that push operation. What would that be? Like you guys said, the push operation is log of n. So I'll just answer it. So all of log of n, and it's our if same, that's just only one, and then our while. So this is actually the meters, right? Because we have we have to go through all of this regardless. You go through all of the notes. So Worst case, I mean, not worst case, just only cases n. And then we have to push our n um, nodes into our priority queue. So n times log, uh, log k, in this case, because we only at most have eight elements inside the priority queue at a moment. So therefore, it'd be log k. And then afterwards, we just return dummy node. Yeah. Any questions? If there are no questions, um, we're just going to launch the poll right now um, and see how easy, difficult, medium level, just right. Awesome. That's great. So, we about wrap it up. I'll hand it back over to Bill. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, we did keep you over eight minutes, but really appreciate those of you who stuck around. And for those of you especially who stuck around for the breakout rooms, I know it is uh, not some people, 
life experience, but um, I think it's really valuable to be able to collaborate with people when you're working on these kind of problems and to vocalize what you think about them, because I think that is super important. So congrats to those of you who stuck around and we'll see you next week. We'll talk about uh, more advanced array problems, uh, stuff like a uh, sliding window, um, fast and slow pointers, um, just like more advanced that we think is going to be super useful when tackling harder array problems. Otherwise, thank you and see you next week. If anybody wants the attendance code, it's with So I will.